I will now introduce Dr. Nigel Newbert. He will talk uh, about uh, VR technology. He's from the University of West of England, and the title of this uh, seminar is Autisme og VR teknologi i klasserommet. Thank you. Oh, thank you Thank you very much for the introduction and the warm welcome. So yes, um, my name's Nigel Newbutt. I'm from, I'm from uh, a university in Bristol, which is in the southwest region of the UK. And I've been doing some research looking at virtual reality and how that technology can be um, used by autistic groups in particular. So I'm just going to talk a little bit today about I guess briefly covering the background of, of what, how autism is defined, certainly within a UK context. And then I'm just going to tour briefly through some virtual reality work that's been undertaken within autistic studies over the last 30, 40 years. I'm then going to talk a bit about a couple of research projects that we've done using VR with autistic groups in schools. Um, and then try and finish, I guess, with some messages in terms of how VR can be best deployed and used within school contexts. So I'm not too sure what the context in Norway is like, but in the UK there are significant challenges around getting technology into schools, getting teachers to support the use of technologies in schools in some cases, um, and certainly some of the other challenges around costs and the expense of technology in schools is a sort of a context which kind of surrounds some of what I'm going to talk about. I'll finish then, as it says here, briefly with some sort of future challenges and what some of the responsibilities and the ethics around using this technology might be. So firstly, just a little bit about me. Um, I have a digital media background, um, which is where my undergraduate degree is within. And I also have then a master's in education and pedagogic um, type areas. Um, and then also um, looked through my PhD work to link special education and psychology together. So I kind of come at this from a sort of triangulated approach, I guess, in terms of being a bit of a technologist, a bit of an educationist, and a bit of a psychologist looking at the use of technology for these particular groups. Um, I've just, I guess, got some experience of using different technologies with autistic groups. Um, and I've also spent a lot of time work collaborating with a range of stakeholders within this work, because I think the most successful sort of deployment and uptake of technology I've seen within this field has been when collaboration has taken place. And that includes technology companies and technology contexts, as well as schools, teachers, parents, and autistic youths themselves. So I work in, come from a very sort of collaborative paradigm. Um, and also, my, my research, uh, I'm, I'm very keen um, to sort of promote the idea that research should be now moving away from labs in universities and being undertaken in the settings they can most benefit some of these particular groups. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some of that in particular actually working within in, in, in situ settings. So apologies if this kind of covers areas that are very obvious to you, but just to kind of briefly pick on the, up on the idea that autism is a condition that has sort of three key areas um, of, 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 of concern, I guess. They are around issues of social functioning, social communication, and restrictive or stereotype behaviors. And it's considered a spectrum, and within the UK context, that spectrum is defined as with or without learning difficulties associated with, with, with that condition now. And within the UK, the National Autistic Society, as you can see there, predict that around 700,000 people in the UK have an autistic spectrum condition. Um, and taken together with families and support networks, that can impact about 2.8 million people within the UK. Um, as a sort of a, a ratio, that sort of represents about one, about one in 68 of the population in the UK. And in parts of the states, for example, in America, that can rise to as many as one in 56. So it is a condition that's being diagnosed more and more, so the prevalence is, is, is increasing. It tends to impact or is more reported in males and females. Um, and there are some issues around that, which I, I, I won't go into now. Uh, and it's also a condition that's lifelong. So we are not here, or this, certainly this work that I'm talking about is talking about how we can support the educational aims and outcomes of these particular populations. So technologies have been, and computers and applied technologies have been shown to support autistic people from a research evidence base in a range of ways. Um, to initiate in, in interactions, to slow down communication processes, 
to mediate face-to-face -face channels of communication, so the idea that maybe they don't have to talk to another human being, they can com communicate through a computer or through a piece of technology. In some cases, provide a voice and to be heard even, using things like picture exchange communication systems uh, through technology. Support and test social situations, which is something particularly that autistic people um, have concerns with, uh, and obviously learning things like communication skills and facial recognition have all been areas that have been covered within the research evidence to date. Um, and computers and technology are being used with these uh, populations primarily because they're predictable and controllable, uh, and that very much talks to uh, a, an autistic individual with the condition that, that I've briefly outlined. They're not always socially complex or overly complex, so they're simplified versions of the real world in some cases. They can be less worrying and stressful for some, and we've seen that with some of the VR work I'm going to talk about, the idea that you can visit somewhere virtually before going there in the real world, and that can help in some cases you know, reduce cognitive pressures and worry and stress. Um, they can also be a place, a place to test different situations, socializing, communication, without real-world consequences, which again is an appealing uh, sort of context for autistic uh, individuals. They often involve a one-to-one -one interaction, so often it will be a person using a piece of technology one-to-one. -one. So that in itself is less complex, uh, and it can enable them to process and deal with things in their own time, and that is again it's a, is, is very appealing. And most importantly, they can, in many ways, play to the strengths of the autistic communities. And certainly in the UK, that's very much the sort of paradigm shift that we've seen. We're moving away from sort of medical-based models of defining autism and thinking about actually how, what are the strengths that the autistic community have and how can we play to that and how can, can we sort of link into that. And technology is being seen as one, one area to, that we can do that. So this is just something I put together recently that I thought was useful, just to give a brief sense of the sort of timeline of how technology has been used within research settings mainly um, across the last 40 years or so. And you can see it's nothing particularly new in some ways. Since the 1970s, looking at how multimedia computers, as they were described then, can be used to support autistic um, individuals, um, program things like teaching, reading skills, verbalization skills, and then right the way through to most recent sort of um, technologies where we've seen things like iPads, touchscreen technologies, and of course, virtual reality technologies. So it is a field that has some sort of situation um, over the last 40 years. But that said, when we look at the actual evidence to support the use of virtual reality um, with autistic people, we can see that the evidence base is slowly but surely growing since the 1960s on the far left through to 2017 here. So the evidence base is increasing, which gives us, and I think as teachers, as educators, we often look to the evidence base, don't we, in terms of what we should be doing and how we should be doing it, and does this have a positive outcome in any way for, for the people we're working with? So that's a sense of the evidence base increasing over the last 30 or 40 years. And when we look at where that evidence is situated, it mainly comes from a, a UK and a US context, primarily. Um, which is more for interest uh, than any further examination than that at this point. So just kind of in sum, I guess, the idea that head-mounted display virtual reality technologies can be used in a similar way to how other technologies have been used, I think we hypothesize. So the idea of making a mistake without real-life consequences, learning and developing and testing social skills, alongside developing confidence, and I think that's really important. The idea that you can rehearse something and develop confidence through doing that is something that is potentially appealing for this type of technology. And also things like communication and collaboration skills, which we've seen developed within these spaces. And of course, one of the big questions within this field is about real-world generalization. In other words, can what is being experienced in the virtual reality environment, can that learn and then be transferred into a real world setting? Which is one of the sort of questions that we haven't really started to tackle in enough detail. So one of the first sort of pieces of virtual reality head-mounted display technologies um, used within this field was by colleagues in the US, Dorothy Strickland and colleagues in the mid-1990s. As you can see, used a piece of very large head-mounted display coupled to what I'm sure would, would have been very large computers in a lab in California. And you can see the type of graphics that they were developing at that time. And this was about teaching 
uh, road safety and road crossing skills um, in autistic youths. And really they wanted to address two things. Would somebody with autism wear a head mounted display? And if they were willing to wear it, because they can sometimes present with sensory um, concerns, would they then experience it in a real enough way to learn something within that? So that, that, there were some questions that they were exploring in, the, in, the nine, in 1996. But then when we think, so what was the next piece of work that kind of built on that and looked at head-mounted display technologies um, with autistic youths or autistic individuals at all? It wasn't until 2015 and 16 that we see the next published work uh, emerging within this field. So there's quite a big gap. And that probably doesn't surprise many of you because the technology was in entirely unaffordable and lab-based within university settings primarily then. And of course, in about 2015, we start to see commercially available um, virtual reality becoming um, placed in the hands of people, researchers and you know, other people to, you know, to take that forward. So there's a 20-year gap. And although in between that gap and leading up to the sort of commercialization of some of this technology, there was a lot of keen interest and propositions for the use of it with autistic people. Um, in the UK context, again, mainly pushed by the, you know, by, by the press. However, no questions were being asked of the autistic community about would they would be willing to wear this technology, use this technology, accept this technology? Would they find it something that could benefit them in terms of their learning? Um, and that was some of the work that we started to do in 2016. Even would they feel sick? Would they tolerate the virtual reality head-mounted displays? Uh, how many of you have used a VR headset, I wonder? So you'll all know, won't you, that it can give you some quite funky feedback and make you feel a bit particular, shall we say. So but people hadn't asked the questions of the autistic communities like this. Would they feel sick? How would they like to use it? Would they respond well to it? So the first piece of work we did was almost to replicate some of that work in the, from the 1990s and work with a range of different autistic individuals from 17 to 53 in terms of their age. Um, and we asked them, would they be willing to wear a head-mounted display? You can see here an Oculus Rift, a very portable piece of kit now. So we've gone away from only being able to work in labs, but actually take the kit into settings. And we worked within a community rehabilitation center. This was uh, in, in America. And we were able to ask questions around acceptance and around presence and immersion and any negative effects that they felt. And it probably doesn't surprise you in terms of moving forward to what we found that there was a total willingness to wear the head-mounted display and the headphones. So you could see in the previous picture, we had a joystick interface and we had some headphones and you can see a couple of people here wearing that. And they entirely across the board, the people we worked with were willing to wear that headset and the, and the, and, and the headphones. They were able to use the input navigation uh, within the environments. There was a good use of bodily interactions in response to the virtual environment that they were seeing, standing up and moving about and trying to pick things up that they could see in the virtual environment. They reported, importantly, a high level of presence and immersion and ecological validity, which is feeling natural in the space. So they reported very high levels of those things, but most importantly, very low levels of negative effects. So Comparing it to other studies using screen-based media, they were even lower than negative effects reported in those studies. So we started to tease out the sense that maybe this is a good technology and a good fit for these, for these potential populations. We also found that anxiety was not increased after using the virtual reality experience. It actually decreased, but we didn't want to make any grand claims that it reduces anxiety, but rather it just doesn't increase anxiety. So we started to tease out. We worked with about 33 people. So it's not a huge study, and it's not representative, of course, of everybody with autism. But it is starting to tease out that this is a potentially acceptable technology. But then when we undertook a, a meta-analysis, bringing together all of the different studies looking at virtual reality in educational contexts for autistic groups, we found that there was a huge gap in terms of the amount of studies. And part of what we concluded was that while there was some grounds for optimism using VR in schools for autistic groups, more research is needed on the use of this technology within educational settings to ensure robust recommendations can be made, which is, I think, where we're kind of at at the moment. Um, so then looking to take that forward, again, we felt it was important to engage with schools in, the, in a UK setting. Apologies, I'm not too sure how schools and researchers um, kind of work within a Norwegian context, but it's, I'm driven by working with schools within schools and sort of asking some of these key questions. So we worked with 
four schools in the UK, and we wanted to work with teachers, parents, and autistic individuals, and we wanted to ask them questions around what type of virtual reality technology might they prefer to use. And that included asking the teachers, because all of these have cost implications, they have technology setup implications, and so on. And so we wanted to ask what type of device might be best for them, and we asked a few other questions which I'll, which I'll come to. So you can see here we've used, I'm not sure if you've come across this, this Class VR, it's an augmented virtual reality headset which is supposedly a sort of made for educational setting device. It has no wires or cables, it's a, it's a standalone piece of, piece of kit. We then have got the Google Cardboard, Google Cardboard or Cardboard device here, which is very cheap, inexpensive, and we've got sort of the top of the range HTC Vive sort of entertainment gaming uh, virtuality device. And we took all of those in to schools to work with teachers and, and autistic individuals. We didn't design any content on any of those. We were still at the point of using kind of off-the-shelf materials, if you like. Um, and within the HTC device, we used things, as you can see here, like Google Earth, in-cell VR, so scientific type stuff going inside human bodies. They had a science week, so we used VR to kind of link with that. Museums, walking around a museum uh, uh, and a fun house, which involves some sort of motor input devices um, or input context as well. This is kind of what they look like. So you've got on the left, yeah, your left, your left, um, a moonscape that they could tour around using the Google, Google Cardboard. You've then got on the top, um, going into the pyramids of Egypt with the Class VR headset. And then you've got the sort of um, HTC setup where they were in a fun fair doing different things, moving about, um, and sort of testing some motor skills actually within that context. So just briefly, this is what they actually look like, moving, excuse all of this stuff, but you get the sense in terms of the difference of, with the, of the graphics uh, and what they were doing. So they had hands they could see with their controllers, and they had to pick things up and do things um, in a particular way to progress through the, you know, through the interface or the game, if you like. Likewise, with the, pyramid, the with pyramids, this was a 360 video or a 360 set of images rather than something as interactive as you just saw. So all you can do is sit there and look around the space in this particular environment. And likewise, with the moonscape, this was a little bit more interactive in so far that you could press a button on the top of the Google Cardboard and you would actually move around the space, while you could also look around it in a 360 context, as you can, as you can see. This just gives you an impression or a sort of a sense of some of the classes and the students that we worked with using the equipment. You might imagine um, that we work with small groups. We are very conscious of the health and safety context around using some of these technologies. Um, VR you know, has been reported to make people feel a bit dizzy and so on, so we sat people down, we worked with two or three students at a time, pupils at a time, um, and we gave them the chance to use all of the technology in a systematic way, working from one to the other to the other and then we undertook some questionnaires and asked, uh, asked for some feedback. And this just gives you a sense. We were quite lucky in one way that we had a lot of space given to us within one of the schools. So you can see here we had a whole room dedicated to some of this technology and setup. And you can see here one of the students um, working, um, I think he was doing some drawing within Google Tilt Brush within this particular interface. And likewise, we've got somebody else here who was having fun with some bow and arrows and uh, shooting targets. But it just gives you a sense of how they were using it. They were, all of them were very calm using the technology we found. Um, we also found all the teachers reported seeing people collaborating and talking to one another. So on some occasions, I think you can see on, no, these pictures don't demonstrate, but on some occasions we had somebody using the device and somebody watching them using, using the device in terms of seeing what they could do on this screen. And what we started to see was they were trying to help each other out and collaborate and talk about what they were seeing, which the teachers reported as being quite unique in terms of them not traditionally doing that in a classroom setting. So we start to tease out what some of these technologies might be useful for, I think. And if, I think this is a clip where somebody might be, no. So you can see, we can see what she's doing on the screen and other students, uh, you know, as I said at times, were starting to sort of provide feedback and encourage them um, through, through, through some of the things they were working on. So like I said, we worked with four schools. In the UK, we have, again, apologies for not understanding the Norwegian system, but in the UK, and it may be similar here, we have a special educational needs setting of schools, so you have someone's nodding, you have similar, and we have mainstream settings. We wanted to work with both, because in the UK, 
most autistic people are in mainstream settings. Um, so we wanted to work with all, a range of different contexts to understand what technology was being used and how it was being used. This just gives you a sort of a snapshot of the profiles that we worked with. And you can see we worked with 43 students overall, ranging from 6 to 16. So the work we did in the States include, involved 17 to 53-year-olds, primarily because of the ethical and health and safety issues in, the, in, in America. We didn't really want to tackle that too much. We worked with adults. Um, this, we wanted to work with children and get sort of younger responses to this technology. So you can see, obviously, in the special needs setting, they were all autistic pupils we worked with, and you can see across the mainstream setting, um, there was a sort of a 50-50, 60-40 split. So we first of all asked about device preference. And the next slide gives you an overview, as you can see here, of the reported preference for those devices. Um, Probably no surprise to find out that the sort of the highest or the most expensive device um, reported by the pupils was, 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 was their favorite. This was followed by the Google Cardboard or the sort of low-tech um, option. And unfortunately, the Class VR option was, was, the, most le was the least preferred um, reported by those groups. I would point out at this point, actually, that we didn't explore all of the possible options in terms of what these devices could do. So I'm sure that they might be able to do more things than we ex experimented with. So a slight caveat in there. But nonetheless, that was a sort of a picture of what they reported, like in most and, and, and least. What we also did was ask some series of questions after they'd used the, the VR um, experiences. And we classified those questions into three factors. The first factor was how much they enjoyed them and how useful they found the, that particular technology in the environment. The second factor, and that's the blue uh, represented by the blue bar across the four schools, the yellow bar represents physical experiences. So did they feel any negative experiences? And the final bar, um, which is a sort of a ready brown, um, would they use it again? Would they like to use it again or recommend it to, to, to others? And you can see here on a scale of zero to four, zero being not very much, four being very much, there was a sort of a high level of acceptance across all of those factors. So again, we start to see that these are really useful, potentially self-reported useful technologies for autistic groups. We then gave them eight different questions, asking them why, how might they like to use VR. And these range from developing social skills, making friends, relaxing them, developing learning opportunities, uh, and others. And really, the three sort of things that reported the highest by them were that it relaxes them and makes them feel calm, followed by they can develop learning opportunities for school, and they can go places virtually and see what they look like using VR head-mounted displays. So I think by going sort of into the field, as it were, and working with some of these groups, we started to really tease out how best these technologies might be used for these particular um, groups. Of course, we engaged with the teachers to sort of tease out what some of the positives and what some of the challenges might be to this technology. And you can see here, excuse that it's quite wordy, but the teachers thought that interactive experiences, tours of visits before the visit happens in, in the real life could be useful. Interactive social stories could be something that could be developed using VR. Somebody said, this is the technology pupils have a grasp of and, to get, and get excited about, and we have a duty to include it in their learning experiences. And that's certainly what we found, that there was a level of excitement about using this, I think, by all of the pupils. Somebody said they were amazed how pupils who don't normally speak to each other began supporting each other and communicating positively, which is something else that emerged, um, to make lessons more interesting and also children could learn in a therapeutic environment. So linking the idea that these are calming spaces with that we can build in some learning, we've got kind of got a win-win potential situation. However, it's not without challenges. I think we're, we would all recognize that. And you can see some of the feedback we got was it could be difficult to get some students off VR. You know, autistic pupils can sometimes present with ob obsessive compulsive tendencies, and I think having a technology or something that they can get very immersed in could be, you know, could be an issue. Appropriate space in classrooms came up. So we were lucky we had quite a big space, but not all classrooms have that, not all schools have that affordance. So they identified space being a potential barrier. Class sizes uh, and the experience of teachers being able to control this technology and be comfort comfortable using this technology was reported as a potential challenge. And of course, costs. 
which is something in the UK with education being significantly sort of underfunded. There are issues around costs and how schools can make use of this or afford to buy this type of technology, even if it's got some good evidence to support that it can benefit um, a range of people. So you can see, yeah, what I was just going to point out here is, is, of course, this device is wired, and that does represent health and safety challenges, I think, if, it, if we're moving forward, where some of the devices were cable-free, which I think is a, a huge advantage in, in a school setting, potentially. So this starts to tell us that I think that there is a good fit between head-mounted displays, VR, and autistic pupils. Um, we've sort of seen that by going into the field and asking the views from the ground up, I think. Research has tended to research about autistic groups, and we're very interested in sort of researching with autistic groups to kind of work from a grounded-up approach, I guess. We know that ecological validity is high in the sense of presence and immersion is very much experienced in VR. Negative effects remain quite low through both of the pieces of work that we've done, and there's this excitement about using the technology, so why wouldn't we explore it? I think that's, that's, that's something we're, we're looking to do next. So there is a potential, I think, for education, lifelong skills, and providing access to services used in virtual reality. So in one example, I'm just going to briefly, have I got time? I'm OK for time-ish. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk through one example. So on the basis of the feedback we got from the students, Science Week was coming up. I'm sure most schools have some sort of Science Week. Um, so they had a Science Week that was coming up. And what we thought we would do was, Traditionally, some of the pupils can get very anxious about visiting a science museum, and this was a science museum in Bristol. Um, and so what we thought we'd do was create a virtual reality tour of that museum that the students could experience before they went there. Um, and so this could support a visit to a new or unusual space for the pupils, and it could be applied in the classroom using the technology that we just agreed was a potentially good fit for them. So we worked with, we're quite lucky in Bristol, we have a VR lab that's been funded through some local enterprise funding. Um, and we've got a range of great artists and technologists working within that. So we collaborated with those just to create a small pilot study. And we worked with a museum called We The Curious in Bristol. Have you, you've smiled and you've come across that, okay, great. And what we did was working, or what that company did, um, and I'll show name the company that we worked with, Go Virtually was the company we worked with. And they created this really, well, you can see, there was a, it's a series of photographs that are stitched together of the environment. And you can walk through the entire museum. And you can navigate by just looking at these dots. So in the virtual reality headset, you would look at the dots, and it would transport you to that space, as you can see, move you around the space. You can bring up little pop-out menus to tell you what the display is going to do, what it tells you, as you can see here. So what we did was we just gave the students free reign to use this in a classroom, again, working with pairs of students. And we just had a Google Cardboard headset with a couple of mobile phones. So it's something potentially that is a bit more accessible, we felt, than a couple of the other technologies. We only worked with a very small group of 11 autistic children with a mean age of 12, um, 12, 12 and a half, just about. And we basically got them to answer questions related to experiences of visiting museums generally. We then gave them the chance to experience the VR tour. We then did some follow-up questions about the VR aspect of it, but also about visiting a, a museum. We then took them to the museum four days later, and then we did a follow-up um, post-museum visit questionnaire just to see if, if the VR maybe had any impact on them. We, of course, checked for cyber sickness and eye strain and issues like that, of, course, of which there were none reported. So again, what we found was, on a scale of zero to four, I guess, we found that, again, they reported of sort of very high levels of acceptance around the, well, sorry, high levels um, of enjoying the app, of finding the app relaxing to use. So those things come, are, are coming out to the fore again. They felt it helped them prepare for the visit. Um, you know, this is sort of their words, I guess. And it helped them to understand what to expect. And what we saw when they were using the app was that they were actually talking to each other about going to different parts of the museum. And you could see them walking through the museum virtually, planning where they were going to go. And the teachers reported that when they went there, the students, as soon as they got through the door, they were able to know and navigate where they were going to go. One thing we didn't account for, you probably noticed from the tour that it's empty. So this was done when it was closed. But of course, in real life, there was a few. I think we were promised to have access where there would be no other schools. But of course, when we turned up, it was full of lots of schools and lots of pupils. So it was a bit more noisy and a bit more overwhelming. But nonetheless, the students were able to have arrived, knowing what to expect to see, plotted some routes through the museum, and they seemed to follow those. 
was the feedback we had. Um, so in terms of after the tour, did they find the museum to be loud and distracting? They reported that to be fairly lowish or middle. I found it to be confusing and I got lost. Again, they reported that very low, which is good. Um, they knew where things were, is what they, and they reported that quite high um, in terms of levels of acceptance. And they also found the, or reported, finding the app helpful to visit the space before they visited in the, you know, in the real world, I guess. So they started to then suggest that the VR app might have helped them to enjoy the visit more than if they hadn't used the VR app. So without wanting to make any grand claims that it was definitely because of the VR experience, I think it just, again, starts to give us an understanding of how VR might be able to benefit some, some of these groups that we're looking to work with um, moving forward. So I think some of the interesting points we took away from that, again, was that the VR app helped to calm and relax the children. It seemed to help them know what to do um, and what to expect before they visited. Um, it also helped to alleviate issues of confusion, I think, in terms of what they were going to be faced with and how they might deal with that. Um, it helped, obviously helped them to visualize the space before they went there in quite a sort of realistic manner. Um, you know, that sense of presence and immersion that we talk about, and that's that sort of connection. And by the way, I think when we talk about immersion and presence, the reason that it's important is because that connects with generalizability. So the more immersed and present we feel somewhere, the greater the generalizability uh, becomes. And the reports of museums being distracting were actually similar before and after they visited. So a bit of caution applied around this, but we found it a very interesting sort of experiment to do. So I think overall, the use of low-tech options could prove useful in schools. We found the very expensive high-tech solutions to be a bit overwhelming for teachers uh, in, in some cases. I would suggest that we start to think about experimenting by downloading some free content that links with curriculum, which is something that the school's moving forward with. Using a smartphone with a Google Cardboard device seemed to be okay for most of the students. They enjoyed that. Um, and also consider using VR for calming or reducing um, issues in the classroom uh, in terms of a change of sensory environment, potentially, because that's what the students seem to report liking it for. So again, in terms of how can we use VR in schools, what do we need to know? It's certainly that some of the messages that we would sort of push forward were around, you'll definitely need some physical space, some time, and a chance to try things if you want to use VR in schools with autistic groups. Using a head-mounted display is fine. A, sorry, a cardboard head-mounted display is fine. I've still carried mine with me in my bag that was used by 43 pupils over a you know, six-month period, and it's still intact. A bit of sellotape, but it's still intact. We found very limited, if any, reasons to believe that VR and head-mounted displays would have any negative effects, but you, know, you need to continue to monitor that. You know, we did follow up with the pupils to make sure they weren't feeling sick you know, an hour after, three hours after, and so on. Using a YouTube app with 3D content on a smartphone with a Google Cardboard device and linking that content to history, science, geography, social sciences within schools could be a way that you might want to experiment moving forward. And finding some relaxing content as well is something that we would sort of recommend in terms of what we've found so far. In terms of bridging the gaps, um, so these are some messages from one of the head teachers that we worked with, actually, and thinking about how his school might adopt some of this. And we have just recently produced a kind of a quick guide for teachers using, wanting to use VR in, in, in schools with autistic people. And that's something that will be available in terms of just summarizing what we found and how we think this might, you might want to start working with VR in schools with autistic people. And that is something I can certainly provide uh, through, the, through the conference. But the head teacher's um, sort of feedback were, or messages were to identify a need. What do you want to use virtual reality head-mounted displays for? How is it going to improve things? Where is it going to fit? Identify what you're currently doing and what you're doing if you're doing anything about it and how effective it is. So things like travel training, so which is something we looked at with the, with, with, with the museum context. So look at what you're currently doing and look at how VR can potentially improve that and it make sure it links in with that. Researching the available and appropriate options, so being aware of what the cost, what the technology sort of infrastructure you would need might be, um, and potentially working with VR communities and researchers to make that happen would be one way that he suggested. Bidding for equipment as well, and making sure if you do bid for equipment that training needs are embedded within that. So often we find, again, I'm not sure what it's like in Norway, but in the UK, if you go to 
any school and look in their technology cupboard, there'll just be mountains of iPads and computers just still in the cupboards that haven't been opened or used and have become obsolete and potentially. And I think one of the issues around that is around training. You know, what can, we've got this device, what can we do with it? How can we quickly adopt it and use it in our classrooms? And I think that's something that you, needs to be identified from the outset and supported. Staff, which links then to staff training uh, and the commitment to continue uh, de developing staff around the use of some of this technology. Thinking, he suggested looking at a five-year cycle in terms of outcomes um, and results. So sticking with it. Don't just think that this is going to be something that can be parachuted in for a few months and have a huge impact. You might need to embed it and have a longer-term sort of picture in terms of what you might expect from that technology. And of course, the cost issue. In the UK, we have things called academy trusts which are a collection of schools that have often come together and been funded together. And the idea that potentially that collection of schools can own some technology that can be circulated between them is one sort of way that he suggested you could get around the issue of cost. But my final sort of thoughts and messages really are, in order for this field to move forward successfully, it's been moving very slowly, as you would have seen from the 1996 to the 2018 sort of research field. If this is to move forward quickly, we need to collaborate. We need to work with teachers. We need to work with researchers. We need to work with psychologists. We need to work with technologists and so on. It's obvious to most of us here, but it's something that hasn't often happened within this field. We need the evidence. I think we all need evidence to support what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, and that is something that needs to come out of the work that we, as we move ahead. So the evaluation of this work is important. We need content. We're desperate for content. You know, I haven't yet started building bespoke content. We did one project that you saw there with the We The Curious, but content is key. I think we've got the technology, we've got the hardware. We need the content now. We need bespoke modules that will help support communication or social skills or job interview skills or whatever it might be that we're wanting to develop with these particular populations. We need to involve the autistic communities. Again, in the UK, that's something that shifted quite quickly over a short period of time. As I said before, we've moved away from researching about autistic people. We're now researching with autistic people, which I think is a, we stand to learn a lot more and have better outcomes for autistic groups if we do that. So or, involving autistic communities is really important. And that includes teachers, the pupils, parents, and so on. And obviously access, which is really important. So place in the hands, the technology in the hands of the people who can benefit, if that's what we're saying. We've got to make sure that it's scalable, that we've got some sort of model behind that to enable that to happen. Otherwise, frankly, it's fairly useless if we're developing an argument for this technology being really good over here, but we can't get it over there. So those are some of the things, the challenges, the thoughts, I think, from the work that we've done so far and moving that ahead. So just to really finish by thanking the organizers for inviting me to come and speak to you. Thank you all of you for sort of listening to what I've had to say, and hopefully it's, some of it's resonated or, or, or answered a few questions that you may have had. I've had an autistic mentor with me through this, um, helping to feed into the work that I've been doing, and I must thank him. And also thanks to the schools who have given their time to participate in this work, because we, you know, we all know how precious time is within schools. I'll be about for the rest of the evening um, and tomorrow if there are any specific questions that might be useful to discuss. I don't think we have time in this format for them necessarily, do we? But I'll be around. So thank you so much for your attention and listening to what I've had to say. I really appreciate it. Thank you.